good afternoon everyone and uh, welcome to the second uh, talk of this uh, session and uh, today his speaker is uh, well known to many of us it is our own department colleague uh, professor subhaditya bhattacharya and uh, he did his uh, phd from harishchand research institute after uh, doing phd he went for post doc uh, in university of california riverside and then he joined iit guwahati as an assistant professor and at present he is serving as an uh, associate professor in our department his research interest li lies various areas starting from physics beyond a standard model dark matter and uh, collider physics um, and many other physics uh, many other fields and uh, uh, many of you know but uh, many of you don't know that he is quite uh, good in uh, singing ghazal also and uh, apart <laughs> from other extracurricular activities and i am and we are especially thankful to him because uh, we were uh, uh, searching uh, the speaker from our department and with a very short notice he agreed that okay he will deliver a talk on a very interesting topic and i can see from the number of participants that people are really very excited to uh, listen to him so i'll not come between uh, suvaditya and the people and now i uh, with that uh, i hand over the floor to suvaditya and uh, let's the let's the mystery to be unravel yeah pankaj better not to come because it's dark matter and dark energy you know how much people yeah. have and the cross section we don't know any issue with it the floor is open yeah suvaditya please okay uh, so once again um, it's uh, my department colloquium but it's a privilege to be a part of it and i'm thankful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to uh, talk about the things that i have been working in recent times and uh, uh, however before i start uh, first of all we need to do the technicalities correctly which is to share my screen and the slides with you and you have to kind of raise your voice because now i will not be able to see any of those uh, news feeds rather but uh, my slides will only be there with me so is the slide visible the first slide yeah yes okay okay so you all know that uh, the title of today's talk is hunt for dark matter of the universe and uh, as you can imagine that uh, this all indicate that there is more matter than those which shines and it all started uh, somewhere in 1933 when a swiss astronomer called fritz zwicky um he was studying the radial velocity dispersion in galaxies in coma cluster so this is a funny picture of uh, fred zwicky and uh, what he did was very interesting at those days that he used actually virial theorem and uh, in virial theorem what you can do that you can tweak the uh, newton's second law uh, to write it uh, in terms of double derivative of mi ri square to equate to ri dot fi plus mi Uh, into v v i square, okay. And when you take a time average for a sufficiently long time, you can assume that this fluctuations. If you assume that the distribution of the matter in the galaxy is almost uniform, then this left hand side actually vanishes, okay. So that gives you an opportunity to relate this uh, m i v i square to r i dot f i. Now, if you take uh, the classical gravity, then r i dot f i average can be related to our famous g m i n j y r. Okay. so therefore that will give you a relation between the mi vi square average to this sum over i sum over j g uh, mi mj by ri j average so therefore what you can do that now given that uh, we have some you can do two different things that given the knowledge of the masses you can compute the velocity and it turns out that uh, he found out that the velocities uh, that could be extracted using the known masses of the galaxies and galaxy clusters turns out to be much much faster than than than, than, uh, than that uh, which can be kept within the galaxy cluster so the velocity is turned out much faster on the other hand you can use the velocities roughly i mean which you can expect to be uh, for the galaxies to move in within the galaxy cluster and compute the total mass in the galaxy cluster so here there was this mystery that he found out that the calculated total mass was something like 4.5 into 10 to the power 13 solar mass 
Whereas the observed one that we know of was uh, something about 8.5 into 10 to the power 7 solar mass. So there was a discrepancy. So either you want to explain it in terms of velocity discrepancy or in terms of mass discrepancy, there was a huge discrepancy. And he said that this discrepancy is perhaps coming because of the presence of a non-luminous matter in the galaxy. And he gave it a name. And this paper was in German and he called it Dunkel Materie. And I uh, and and this is what is called dark matter in English. Uh, so in a sense, he was the father figure to kind of uh, find out the presence of dark matter in very early in around 1930, uh, 1930s, essentially. But the point is, his paper was first of all in German. It was published in Swedish uh, Academy of Science and uh, it didn't reach many people. So uh, uh, the interpretation that he had was although phenomenal, but uh, not many people could understand what exactly it was. It was rather later, around in 1970s, when Vera Rubin, as a graduate student, was studying the angular motion of galaxies uh, a, by galactic rotation. And so this is a picture of Vera Rubin. And uh, what she found was also very, very fascinating. So this is a picture of uh, the rotation curve of a uh, of the galaxies in a uh, uh, in a galactic core a uh, cluster and uh, you can imagine that when you are within the uh, visible part of the galaxy then you can simply assume a spherical distribution of, uh, of the mass uh, like four third pi r cube rho and then if you substitute that in place of the capital m on the right hand side of the equation then you simply obtain that this rotational velocity should scale as r that is with larger and larger r within the visible part of the galaxy the rotational velocities will go up and what happens beyond the visible galaxy cluster we assume the mass to be a constant like a capital m and so therefore, it is very straightforward to see that this V will go as square root of 1 by R. And this is what is called the Keplerian fall. And this is uh, what is drawn in this black picture because I do not have a pointer. So I cannot indicate where exactly it is. So you can see a orange dot dot line that shows uh, uh, the, uh, the expected behavior uh, of the rotational curve that it goes, uh, goes up and up and up within the visible part of the galaxy and then has a Keplerian fall. But what was actually seen or rather what was actually observed was uh, something quite different that you see actually in the blue line, uh, all right, uh, with, those, with those data points uh, shown by the blobs. And uh, you can clearly see that there is a huge discrepancy between what you expect and what was observed. And this gave rise to this idea that perhaps there is a non-luminous halo of dark matter which is actually prevailing in this galaxy. And that is actually altering this rotational curve of the spiral, uh, uh, rotational curve of the galaxies, which you actually observe. And so this is this is another hallmark for the presence of a dark matter in the universe. And this also later gave rise to a distribution of dark matter in the galaxies, which goes by this formula. Never worry about this. I mean, we will not bother you with this formula any after. But this is just to mention that this was obtained from this uh, fitting the dark matter distribution to get the correct uh, rotational velocity of the galaxies in a galaxy cluster. All right, so let us move on and we will talk about another evidence of dark matter which came in recent past and uh, it was uh, in 2006 by Chandra X-ray Observatory which actually, show, uh, which actually observed the merger or collision of two galaxy clusters and actually the lighter one is called the bullet cluster and this is the picture of it and what you actually see through the telescope is actually this pink region which is pointed out in the middle and this is essentially the luminous matter which is present in this galaxy merger however there are two blue blobs that you see on two sides of this pink region and those are not seen but they could be inferred from what you call the gravitational lensing now, what is gravitational lensing? Now, we all know that we take Einstein's theory of relativity very seriously because it could predict the bending of a light beam. Because you say that uh, in presence of a huge matter, the space time is bent. And so the light actually traverses in a bended, uh, uh, I mean, in that same uh, uh, bent uh, uh, space time. And therefore, what it does that it actually creates a, uh, it creates some image of some uh, distance galaxy, say, for example. Now, 
the bending of the space time can be calculated given the knowledge of the presence of luminous matter in between the object that you are trying to see and between you i mean which uh, you are sitting suppose on the earth however any distortion to this can also indicate the presence of other non luminous massive objects which can give you a further distortion of the images and further bend the space time in between and that is precisely the effect of gravitational lensing to gauge the presence of this non luminous blobs on the two sides of this uh, collided cluster so what this basically says that uh, when this galaxy is uh, 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 when this collision actually occurred there was a big chunk of non luminous matter which actually passed each other but but uh, but they didn't interact too much with each other and also you do not see them in 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 the usual uh, way but you have to infer their presence through gravitational lensing so this was another uh, indication of the presence of a dark matter in the universe and it's also have to be mentioned that although bullet cluster got very famous or this observation got very popular there were other similar observations also made in other cluster collisions like this funny name which i'm writing like mscs j0025.41222 so yeah okay so uh, let's carry on and uh, let me now talk about the evidence of dark matter coming from a completely different thing and that is what is called cosmology so we talked about two astrophysical evidences but now let us talk about something about the cosmology now you we all know that uh, uh, or, or, or suppose uh, uh, i mean the universe started with a big bang and then universe was hot and dense and uh, everything was together and then universe was expanding and as it expanded and cool down at one point of time this uh, uh, plasma state uh, actually changed and hydrogen atom was forming and once the hydrogen atom started forming the photon then uh, you know uh, could uh, start uh, stream freely because before that everything was charged so photon didn't have a free streaming length so it was getting stuck with this electrons and protons which are there in the plasma so the universe was opaque but at some point of time this uh, uh, photon started streaming freely and that happened almost like 13.8 billion years before and this is what is the uh, called the era of recombination and the radiation which left at that time is called cosmic microwave background radiation and uh, 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 it, it, the discovery of cmdr is a very fascinating story and these two gentlemen in the picture penzias and wilson around uh, 1970s uh, uh, 1978 perhaps they got nobel prize for discovering cmdr and what they saw was that uh, it gives you a black body radiation spectrum with a temperature of roughly 2.72 kelvin and it was almost uniform however there is an anisotropy that they could observe and that is roughly 1 in 100000 but this anisotropy in cmbr was something very very crucial later which people then fitted this anisotropy then i'm showing in the picture this is the cmbr power spectrum observed by planck data so it's a satellite born experiment which measures this anisotropy in cmbr and when you fit your lambda cdm model the standard cosmological model into it what you get is something very very stunning and what you get is the following that you inferred from this anisotropies that you see in cmbr spectra that ordinary matter or the visible matter constitutes only something like 4.9% of the universe and dark matter constitutes something like 26% of this universe so this is really really amazing and the rest is something called dark energy and this is uh, uh, you know it has a even larger component but in this talk uh, let me make sure that uh, uh, we are going to talk about only dark matter and we are not going to talk about dark energy and dark matter or dark energy both this term start with dark but they have absolutely nothing in between okay so they are completely different objects so this is a confusion which many people have i have seen so dark energy is something completely different this comes from what is called uh, the vacuum energy or because we see that universe is not only expanding but actually it is accelerating so that's why you need a term like cosmological constant term inserted in your um, uh, 
Einstein's equation, which then goes into the Friedman-Robertson equation and so on and so forth. And this is the source of the dark energy. We do not have much physical intuition of what it could be. So dark energy is something completely different, while dark matter is something completely different. So in this talk, we will focus on the dark matter part. However, it is very important to point out that the percentage with which dark matter is present in the universe is much, 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 much more than the ordinary matter that we see our universe is made up of. So that's really, really amazing. So that's why the quest for searching what dark matter can be is uh, so much important. Now, it is often uh, uh, expressed, this uh, number density of the dark matter which is prevailing in the universe is often expressed in terms of something called uh, relic density. So this is expressed in terms of omega h square, where omega is a cosmological energy density uh, that you write. I mean, this is rho by rho c with respect to some critical density. And this small tiny h that you see around, that is actually Hubble's expansion in the units of 100 kilometer per second per mega per sec. And uh, the recent Planck data has said that this omega h square for the dark matter uh, is lying somewhere between 0 0.1199 plus minus 0 0.0022. So that's an amazing precision with which we can actually predict that how much dark matter is present in our universe. Also, it is uh, it is interesting to note that we are saying that roughly 20% of the energy budget of the universe is dark matter. So in that sense, omega should be 0 0.2, all right? And this h square, is roughly 0 0.5. So that gives you this uh, omega h square of the order of 0 0.1. Okay. So this is one very important constraint that we are going to abide by whenever we are going to talk about dark matter, and that is the relic density of the dark matter. So all this understanding have been developed in uh, recent past, and it was in 2009 that Professor P.J. Peebles actually uh, was awarded with the Nobel Prize and his contribution was enormous in understanding the CMPR and it is interpretation to extract dark matter, dark energy and so on and so forth. Okay, so let me move on to the last slide. And, and so I essentially have talked about uh, different uh, evidences of dark matter coming from astrophysics and also from cosmology. And we have to understand that these two are not quite correlated. So these two are different evidences and that's why it is so compelling to look for what dark matter actually is. And so after people started guessing that there is such a huge component of matter which is present in the universe, which, which we do not know what exactly they are, but their presence is gauged. So therefore, thereafter, people started looking into what dark matter is. So that is my next slide. And that is the next question that we are going to talk about. And here uh, comes the uh, era of particle physicists uh, getting interests in this field of cosmology and astrophysics, because they could uh, gauge that uh, we could think of some fundamental particles, uh, which could can actually mimic the properties of dark matter observed in different satellite borne experiments that we talked so far. So what did we know about dark matter? So for example, it has to be dark and the credential for a particle to be dark is to have its electromagnetic charge neutrality, right? It doesn't interact with photon. So I see you or you see me, I see the laptop and everything because all the atoms that we know of is made up of electrons. So that has uh, interactions with electromagnetic radiation. So that's why this universe is visible because it has uh, uh, electromagnetic interaction. So therefore, whatever that we do not see can be attributed to electromagnetic charge neutrality when it comes to the uh, properties of its fundamental label. The second point is that uh, uh, we have observed the presence of dark matter right now in the universe. So therefore, if we have to think of a dark matter particle, that must be stable. So if it decays away to other visible sector particles, then it will not do the justice to the dark matter relic density that we just talked about. So therefore, the stability is another important credential. So, uh, you know, I mean, so it has to be stable at the Length, uh, lifetime of the age of the universe. That is the correct statement to make. And the third thing is that it better be massive. First of all, we know that all these effects that we have seen so far have come from gravitational effect in a sense. And second of all, that uh, we also think that uh, this dark matter helps in structure formation. So it better be massive. So once things are massive, then uh, it is attributed to a cold dark matter regime, which I will not go into. But basically, it, it, it actually helps uh, to gravitate and from, uh, form structures as we see right now in the universe. So these are the three important credentials that we would like to assign for the dark matter for the time being. 
And then uh, there are further classifications. There are three major classifications that we are going to talk about. Uh, one is called a wing, weakly interacting massive particle or wing. There is something called strongly interacting massive particle or SIM. And there is another uh, uh, characteristic that we have uh, understood so far about the dark matter. The, which can be also feebly interacting massive particle or thin. So you can say, well, all right, strong, weak, and feeble. So this is something that we could have expected. Uh, but this is this turns out that these descriptions of uh, dark matter relic density, the way we can achieve for these three different genres of dark matter particles that we have classified are completely uh, different. Uh, uh, for example, uh, there are two main uh, ways of achieving this uh, relic density one is what is called thermal freeze out which i will come in a moment and the other is called non-thermal freezing so the first two categories wimp and sim they fall into this thermal freeze out category while the feebly interacting massive particle to serve as dark matter falls into the category called non-thermal freezing now this is something that we have uh, developed uh, since last many years and uh, however there remains, you know, because we have not discovered any dark matter yet. So there are many, many unknown issues, of course, like as a fundamental particle, whether these particles are scalars, fermions, or vector bosons, whether these are single component or multi-component, uh, you know, what are the masses and couplings of the dark matter? All these things are actually unknown to us. So there are many, many unknowns, and these are some of the unknowns, you may say. Yeah, so I have one question. Can I interrupt here or no? Uh, I think, Kanhaya, it will be better if we can take up the questions at the end, if you okay. don't mind. Uh, yeah, okay. that, that is simply because I do not know how long I will be able to speak up uh, at uh, together because of this uh, unknown constraint that is impending on us, which is the internet connection. Okay. Swadipto, okay. Uh, just a second. Uh, let me make an announcement. Uh, Mr. Akshay Metri, can you please turn off your video? Mr. Akshay Metri, please turn off your video. Okay, thank you. Continue, please. Okay, so uh, I mean, we are almost there that uh, we have a uh, sort of classification that we have done uh, uh, by saying what is dark matter and we have chalked out some rough credentials that what dark matter particles can be. Having said that, I must also mention that there are other uh, or, or dark objects like, uh, you know, primordial black holes or compact, massive compact halo objects or modified gravity. These are also thought of as dark matter candidates and they have been also studied. But it turns out that, uh, you know, uh, all these different evidences that we have accumulated so far turns out difficult to be explained by any of these uh, ob objects the way that we can do, assuming them to be fundamental particles. So rest of the talk, we will focus on dark matter as a fundamental particle and see the possibilities uh, that uh, lies ahead for detecting them and so on and so forth. Okay, so let me change to the next slide. So uh, our first point of discussion will be about the weakly interacting massive particles or WIMPs. Uh, so the question is, what does WIMPs do? The answer, the one-liner answer to this is that they actually uh, goes uh, uh, to achieve the correct relic density, which we just mentioned in the cosmological evidences via some mechanism called thermal freeze out. Okay. Now, what is thermal freeze out? Let me try to explain. And this is one picture. This is a cartoon, although, but this turns out to be very, very important for us. And here we have shown the interaction between dark matter and the visible sector particle, which are usually called standard model particles. So DM stands for dark matter. And the SM stands for standard model. And this is a two going to two interaction. Two dark matter particles are, uh, are interacting with two standard model particles. So this is the simplest possible uh, um, model that one can think of uh, for having a dark matter visible sector interaction. Now, let us uh, go with this description that what do we mean by thermal freeze out? So the assumption is that in the early universe, uh, everything, uh, including the dark matter, was actually present. And they were interacting with the standard model because the universe was very hot at that time. So the rate of interaction was uh, uh, was uh, large enough to keep the dark matter in equilibrium with the hot soup of standard model particle. So this is the first statement. So when the universe was hot, the interaction rate was domi uh, you know, dominated over the rate of expansion. So the dark matter was in equilibrium. So this gamma is much, much greater than H. H stands for the Hubble's expansion. 
uh, and so therefore when gamma is much much larger than h then you can imagine that dark matter and standard model have uh, too much of talking with each other so then they are in uh, thermal bath now next what uh, when universe uh, cools down the interaction rates slowly uh, you know falls and then there, there there will be a point when this rate of interaction becomes now uh, you know almost uh, the same as the rate of hubble expansion and this is the point when the dark matter has hard time to keep up with the equilibrium and particularly after uh, you know the rate of interaction falls below the expansion rate that is when gamma is much much less than h then the dark matter cannot keep up with the equilibrium any further and it freezes out from the soup of the standard model particle and because it cannot decay further into any other particle so that dark matter relic remains the same after it freezes out okay and that is what we are measuring right now in the cmbr experiment so this is the philosophy of uh, uh, how does wimp uh, gets to the correct relic density uh, for, uh, that is observed for the dark matter so now this slide will be a little technical slide because, uh, uh, i mean and basically we uh, i mean uh, so the, therefore as you can imagine that this uh, freeze, freezing out of dark matter from the equilibrium and gaining correct relic density will be described by an equation where you compare the rate of interaction of the dark matter with the rate of uh, the hubble expansion and this is what is done formally by what you call the boltzmann equations and uh, this is one generic uh, uh, pattern of a simple looking boltzmann equation where on the left hand side you have this term like n psi dot plus 3h n psi and this is the term which is coming from the expansion of the universe because you see this h term which denotes the expansion of the universe the hubble expansion rate on the right hand side on the other hand you have this collision term which i just draw in this funny two going to two picture so this gives you the annihilation the depletion of dark matter number density the annihilation of dark matter into the visible sector particles and that is what is written in terms of this thermal average cross section of sigma v so psi psi bar suppose psi is your dark matter which is annihilating into some other standard model stuff which is called x then sigma into v where v is uh, what is called the molar velocity between the dark matter particles that multiplies with this number densities uh, like n psi n psi bar minus n psi equilibrium into n psi bar equilibrium so this is the equation which actually governs this freeze out mechanism which i just described before there is another thing another mathematical uh, technique that you usually do because you want to simplify this equation and you scale out the expansion by taking uh, uh, you know by rewriting this number density in terms of what you call yield which you define as y equal to n by s where this small s uh, is the entropy density of the universe and also the variable changes from time to temperature and then to x which is defined as m by p and then this equation turns out to be much simpler with some uh, you know constant sitting downstairs at called hm and you see that this three hn term has actually have vanished so this equation the boltzmann equation have taken a new form and it's a simpler form to solve and this uh, uh, looks like dy dx equal to some x into sigma v into s by hmx into y square minus y equilibrium square and you can also recast it in terms of the rate of interaction which i was just talking about so in that case what you have to do that you just have to multiply the uh, equilibrium number density with the sigma v and then this boltzmann equation will look like this uh, uh, and uh, and you can see that there are essentially two regions of its solution one when gamma is much much greater than h then this particle is in equilibrium and when gamma falls below the rate of expansion then it actually gives freeze out so once you solve this boltzmann equation you can actually find out the relic density of the dark matter and what it turns out that this relic density is uh, seen to be inversely proportional to this annihilation cross section through which dark matter number density depletes into standard model and there is an one important number which is sitting in the numerator but uh, i will come to come uh, i will talk about that in a moment so this is uh, this is the methodology by which you do now let me uh, also point it out here that first of all in this freeze out mechanism the relic density that is attributed to the dark matter is inversely proportional to the annihilation cross section which you clearly see from this formula that i have quoted and then now you can show the freeze out in terms of this y versus x plane okay so the y axis is y uh, 
capital Y rather, which is this yield, which is N by S. And al along the x-axis, you have X, which is M by T. Okay, and this is the variable in log. And what you see by this dotted line is this Boltzmann distribution, because when universe was hot, it didn't really matter whether the particles are bosons or fermions. So you can easily scale them by E to the power minus M by T. So that gives you this falling distribution. That is what the equilibrium distribution is. Now, given the amount of gamma or given the amount of sigma V that you have, it actually denotes the freeze out as I have shown. Okay, So this is Y equilibrium. And these points denote the freeze out. And this freeze out gives you the real uh, yield that you actually obtain and from which you calculate the relic density. Uh, in the present universe. And you see that the larger is the gamma, the larger is the sigma phi, the smaller is the relic density. So what it comes out that you have to basically tune your sigma phi appropriately so that you get the correct relic density. And from this, uh, uh, because you remember that omega h square has to be equal to 0 0.1, right? So therefore, uh, you can cl clearly understand what sigma phi we require uh, in order to have a correct relic density in the simplest possibility. and Therefore, the cross section that you get is actually of the order of 10 to the power minus 9 GV to the power minus 2. And this uh, strength of course cross section or this value of the cross section is nothing but the cross section of weak interaction strength. Okay, And that's why this dark matter or this class of dark matter particles which actually goes via this kind of formalism are called weakly interacting massive particle, which gives you correct relic density when their interaction strength with the visible sector to freeze out is of the order of weak interaction strength. So this is what to uh, clarify. All right. So this is uh, this is uh, this is the story about the wimp-like dark matter particles. So let me now come to another class of uh, possibilities, and uh, that is what uh, I noted that this is there is something also called SIMP or strongly interactive massive particle. Now, how do we realize this kind of dark matters in nature? Now, what it says, uh, I mean, the for SIMP-like models, uh, we say that the depletion of dark matter number density doesn't occur between the dark matter and standard model, but actually occurs within the dark sector itself. Like, uh, you know, you have three to two interaction or four to two interaction, like three dark matters annihilating to two dark matter or four dark matters annihilating to two dark matter. So this will also eventually deplete the dark matter number density and actually provide a uh, freeze out of the dark matter. So this is also within the thermal uh, regime that you assume the dark matter to be equilibrium. However, if this process have to dominate over that two going to two interaction that I just talked about, that dark matter, dark matter going to standard model, standard model for depleting its number density, then uh, if this process like three going to two or four going to two has to dominate over that two going to two, then we have to assume that this two going to two annihilation has to be suppressed, right? But then there is a question that you ask that then how do you assume that if the interaction with the standard model is not enough, then how do you assume that dark, dark matter was in equilibrium in the early universe when universe was hot and dense? So therefore, you can say that it's not only that dark matter, dark matter annihilation into standard model, standard model that can be responsible for keeping the dark matter in equilibrium. But actually, you can also have the dark matter scattering with the standard model if that is sizable enough. That can also keep the dark matter in equilibrium. And so therefore, that is the next line that I'm writing, that the dark matter standard model scattering is assumed to be dominant than the three going to two annihilation. But the three going to two annihilation is assumed to be much, much dominant than this two to two dark matter to two standard model annihilation, which characterizes the freeze out of wimp like particles that we just talked about. And so therefore, uh, you know, I'm not going to uh, this. Uh, I mean, this statement is exactly what I state that uh, this this will make sure that we keep the dark sector is in equilibrium with the standard model. But the main depletion channel for uh, yielding a dark matter freeze out is suppose three going to two annihilations. And then uh, there is some mathematical statement behind which uh, I tend to ignore at this point of time. So once again, what you have to do, you have to write a Boltzmann equation. Now the Boltzmann equation changes a little bit because now this is the freeze out is mainly governed by three going to two annihilations. So that's why there is a change that you see on the right hand side, the collision term in the Boltzmann equation. And once again, you do this mathematical uh, thing that I said that you scale out the expansion and you write the number density in terms of yield uh, with respect to the entropy density and you get a Boltzmann equation of this sort. Now, what happens when you solve the Boltzmann equation? You get a freeze out once more. 
you get once more, it frees out that we are getting, but there is a significant difference that the sigma v square that I have, I mean, you perhaps cannot read the numbers there. It's something like 10 to the power 6 GV to the power minus 5 that you actually require for this 3 to 2 annihilation to actually give you the correct dark matter delic density. Whereas, let me remind you that for this 2 going to 2 annihilation, for the WIMP-like particle, the annihilation cross-section that we were getting to get the correct uh, dark matter number density was of the order of 10 to the power minus 9 GB to the power minus 2. So you can easily imagine that the interaction between the dark matters here has to be strong enough so that you get a cross-section of that large uh, amount. So that's why this is called a simple-like framework. So this is also a class of dark matter models uh, with which you can describe the relic density. All right. Now let me come to the third possibility, which uh, uh, which are called the films. So here, unlike the previous two cases, we assume that the dark matter was actually not in equilibrium in the early universe, but it actually had a very feeble interaction. So this is not there in the early universe, but it can be produced in turn from the decay or annihilation of some particles which are already in the uh, thermal bar. And so therefore, uh, unlike freeze out, what you have is uh, what you call the freeze in. So this is the picture. This dot, dot, dot lines that you see here are the cases that you say that, well, I started with zero dark matter number density. Now I slowly build up the number density from the production of some thermal bath particles. And uh, uh, then uh, then it freezes in after the uh, temperature of the universe dropped uh, drops below the dark matter mass itself. So that is why it is called freezing in compared to the freeze out that I just talked about. Okay, so, uh, and it is also understandable that here, the yield or the dark matter number density will be proportional to the decay rate or the production cross-section. And then there is some other mechanism of freezing which uh, have now people realized and that is what is called UV freezing, but let me not go into that. But uh, once again, uh, you, you know what you have to do is to write the Boltzmann equations and uh, uh, the key to write the Boltzmann equations here is to assume that the initial dark matter number density, which was non-zero in the previous cases, will be assumed to zero in this particular case. And then you can find the freezing yield, and you can assume that this, this is proportional to the decay width of whatever particle that is decaying into that dark matter, or the annihilation cross-sections of whatever particle that is producing the dark matter. So it will be proportional to the coupling of the dark matter standard model interaction. All right. Whereas for freeze out, it will be inversely proportional to the coupling of the dark matter standard model interaction. So that's where the freezing mechanisms make a uh, significant difference bit, uh, from the freeze out cases. And what you observe that if you have to get a correct relic density of the dark matter, uh, uh, the coupling for the freezing mechanisms to give you correct relic density has to be of the order of 10 to the power minus 12. Where for, for the freeze out cases, the couplings is of the order of 0.1 to 1, depending on what model that you are actually checking. I mean, module, there are several other modeling uh, inputs that we have ignored so far. But roughly saying that the coupling uh, that you require to produce the correct relic density for the dark matter via freezing mechanism is much, 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 much smaller than the wimp like cases. Okay, so this is why this is called, or this is characterized as a thimp like dark matter. Okay, all right. With this, uh, then we proceed and uh, let's try to find out if there is a really dark matter particle that we uh, we can identify. So let's first look into our own known dictionary, which is called the standard model of particle physics, which uh, you know have. Uh, you know, uh, characterized all the visible sector leptons, quarks, and gauge bosons neatly, including a Higgs boson, which has been recently discovered in 2012 at LHC, which completes almost the structure of the standard model, which actually describes how the visible sector of the universe behaves, excepting for gravity. And we have, uh, uh, we have actually assigned, uh, we know all the details of all the particles and their characteristics. Now, so this is the list actually, this is the picture that is the list and the pink blob that you see, these are, these are called the quarks, which constitutes, you know, the uh, 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 nucleus of an atom. And then there are these leptons like electron, muons and tau's, then there are neutrinos, and then there are force carriers, which are also part 
particles in the uh, uh, quantum world. And so gluon carries the strong interaction, photon carries electromagnetic interaction, Z and W carries uh, weak interaction. And the, nonetheless, there is this Higgs boson, which is responsible for creating masses for all the fundamental particles. And that's also a separate particle which actually exists and which we have discovered. So this is the list of standard model particles that we know of. Now, once again, let us remind that if we have to search for a dark matter within this list, what we have to do? We have to find a particle which is electromagnetic neutral or doesn't have any electromagnetic interaction and also should be stable, right? So shouldn't be decaying. So let's try to find out all the charge neutral particles. So Higgs is a charge neutral particle, but unfortunately it decays. So it doesn't characterize, uh, it cannot, cannot take the place for a dark matter. What about gluons? Gluons are, uh, you know, strongly disfavored because this carries the strong interaction and dark matter, whatever it has to be, it cannot have a take part in the strong interaction. Otherwise, uh, uh, you know, I mean, you know, things would have been completely different. So, so gluons cannot be. What about photon? I mean, photon we do not have to talk about because it carries electromagnetic interaction and the, it goes against the very notion of darkness that we had assigned to this particular particle. And there is also this weak gauge boson Z, which could have been a candidate, but it also decays. So what you are left with, you are left with, with this neutrinos. These are very tiny little weakly interacting uh, particles, uh, which could be best justified as dark matters, but turns out that these also do not, uh, uh, you know, explain the credentials that we have assigned for the dark matter so far. For example, I mean, it cannot give you the correct relic density. It turns out that the relic density for the neutrinos, if you compute, because they are relativistic, they have very tiny mass, this turns out to be way smaller than 0 0.1. So this is almost like 0 0.0005. And then there is another issue like structure foundation, because we want the dark matter to help, uh, you know, gravitate other uh, matter together to form the structures that we see in the universe. And neutrinos does exactly the opposite way because it has a large free streaming length because it's a relativistic particle. So there is no particle that we can find within the uh, uh, within the uh, list of standard model particles which can be uh, thought of as a dark matter candidate. So therefore what to do? You have to uh, uh, go beyond the standard model and find a dark matter candidate or a, find a dark matter particle to serve for the dark matter of the universe. And as we have uh, said so far that all these classifications like we seen for FIM, they are actually very much dependent on how they interact with the visible sector. Like, so the dark matter standard model interaction is the key to build a dark matter model that we understand. So let me now once again bring back this uh, dark matter standard model interaction uh, cartoon. And uh, we can say that, uh, you know, a Lagrangian for dark matter standard model interaction can be written in terms of operators involving the dark matter fields and operators involving the standard model fields. And depending the dimension of the whole operator, it has to be adjusted by one by lambda to the power n minus four, because we know that uh, the Lagrangian density has to be have, has to have mass dimension of four. All right, so this is also, I mean, now if we if we assume that it's a renormalizable interaction that is ODM, OSM should have a mass dimension of four itself, then there are only two operators that we can think of which are invariant under standard model symmetry. And these two operators are H dagger H and B mu nu. So this leaves, uh, and this is, as I said, that this has mass dimension of two. So this leaves with uh, one possible uh, dark matter standard model interaction, and that is the simplest, and this was the first one that people could think of having a dark matter standard model interaction that you stitch this H dagger H where H is the standard model Higgs to a uh, real scalar phi uh, with a square because uh, uh, all the bosons have mass dimension one. So it's a mass dimension four interaction term. However, what you have to do that you have to also make sure that phi is a dark matter and you have to make sure that it doesn't have an electromagnetic charge. That is also something that we can do quite easily in the construction of the, uh, uh, you know, fundamental particles. And we say that, well, it's a singlet and it doesn't have a hypercharge. So that uh, eradicates the possibility of phi having a uh, electromagnetic charge. So this can serve as a dark matter. But there is another point that I mentioned that there has to also be stability of the dark matter that we have to make sure that dark matter cannot decay into visible particles. So therefore, we can we have to make sure that there is only term like H dagger H phi square, and there is no term like phi H dagger H, because in that case, phi will decay to a couple of inches, right? So therefore, in order to make sure that this is the only term that we have, we have to 
uh, we have to say that these five fields, which are uh, our dark matter fields right now, they actually transform under a symmetry. The simplest symmetry is a Z2 symmetry. It's a mirror symmetry, reflection symmetry, that phi goes to minus phi. So you can easily understand that if phi goes to minus phi, the minimum uh, dimension of phi involving terms should be phi squared. And that makes sure that the lowest order dark matter standard model interaction can be written in terms of H dagger H phi squared. So this, uh, gives you the complete Lagrangian of the model. So without a Lagrangian, I mean, no particle physics talk can be complete. So this is the Lagrangian of this particular model that I'm talking about. And this is characterized by essentially two parameters. One is this lambda one, which denotes the coupling of the visible sector with the dark matter. You know that is very important uh, when we assign to the cardiac relic density of the dark matter. And there is another parameter, which is the mass of the dark matter, right? So therefore, you can compute now that annihilation cross section the two going to two which is in the cartoon here is now inflated in terms of actual fine when graphs given the particular model and you can find the cardiac relic density uh, uh, in terms of these two unknown parameters which is the coupling versus the dark matter mass and for this particular model it turns out that this red line that you see in this figure uh, gives you the cardiac relic density and there is a resonance drop because it is mediated by the higgs and it uh, it uh, this resonance drop is actually at a Higgs mass by two, which is at 62.5 GeV. And there is also an, an another point which I'm going to come to that uh, the direct search allowed parameter space uh, it only allows the dark matter to be as heavy as a TeV or so. There are this black and blue dotted lines which shows the sensitivity of this dark matter to show up in direct search experiment, which will be my next slide. So therefore, the next question is obviously that how do we search for dark matter in realistic experiments, right? So as we have imagined so far that our galaxy is basically immersed in this uh, dark matter halo uh, and this we uh, the dark matter in this halo has a typical velocity distribution and basically when it uh, hits the earth detector if we can have it uh, the, uh, the velocity is very very uh, small something like 200 kilometers per second so therefore this will go through an elastic scattering with a detector if we can place and there can be a nuclear recoil as a signature that we can see for uh, uh, for the dark matter to scatter off the nuclei and that can be a way of finding the dark matter of the universe. So these are once again mathematical details. I think I do not have time to go into this. So therefore, uh, this has all this astrophysical inputs like what is the velocity distribution? What is the dark matter density? What is the dark matter mass? And there is also this particle physics part where you compute from your model the, like the way that I described that this G sigma DER, the uh, uh, differential cross section with respect to the recoil energy, which can be easily calculated. Um, so this was the idea which was given around in 1985 by uh, the stream, famous string theorist Ed Witten and uh, uh, with his uh, collaborator, uh, Mark Goodman. And since then, this was uh, this gained a lot of popularity. There were a lot of works which came up and, uh, and there were a lot of experiments that were designed. So for example, there are two ways that these detectors have been designed so far and these experiments are underway. One is called the liquid xenon detector and then other is a solid state device with germanium and you can see that in all these cases we have this heavy nuclei because the amount of recoil will be proportional to the a value of that nuclei so that therefore we choose this kind of a material for this detection of dark matter however what we unfortunately see is a null result so far in this direct search experiment so uh, what you can see in this plot is a wimp nucleon cross section versus wimp mass plot where you are uh, actually uh, trying to see this nuclear recoil but what you have seen only is at the background events so that that will basically give you a sensitivity for the dark matter mass versus the dark matter nucleon interaction cross section and that is what all this busy dotted solid and be different kind of curves that you see in this line are basically the so, uh, uh, saying that well we search for the dark matter but unfortunately we didn't find a uh, uh, nuclear recoil which can be characterized to be initiated by a dark matter uh, event so now what you do that uh, from your theoretician point of view that you compute your relic density allowed parameter space and then you compute your d sigma d e r uh, because I said that that is what you can do. And then you can plot uh, once more uh, uh, your uh, uh, relic density allowed parameter space in this direct search plane, like this uh, dark matter mass versus dark matter nuclear cross section, which you can also come. So that will be some blob like this. 
what you say that non observation of uh, dark matter in the direct search will basically cuts across your parameter space in some way like a, 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 in this uh, a dotted line so current uh, currently the sensitivity is of xenon 1 ton which is of the order of 10 to the power minus 47 centimeter square so basically you rule out the parameter space above this and retain only the green part of this blob and say that this is only the allowed parameter space of my model which is allowed by such uh, non-observation of the dark matter in the direct search. So this is the allowed parameter space and we must mention that uh, this is getting stronger and stronger and eliminating a lot of uh, simple minded dark matter models from business actually the non-observation of dark matter in direct search experiments. There is another, another dangerous thing that we see which is about this uh, orange uh, dotted line that we have and that is what is called the neutrino floor. It basically says, it basically parameterizes that uh, when, it, uh, because there are uh, solar and atmospheric neutrinos which will also come and hit the detector and whenever their strength of interaction will be matched to the dark matter uh, uh, interaction cross section, then uh, you know we, uh, we will not be able to distinguish the dark matter from the neutrino background, right? So that is what is depicted by this uh, dotted line. So this is basically warning us, all of us, that uh, if we do not find a dark matter now in this kind of direct search, life is going to be much, much more difficult after we uh, get into this neutrino floor where the sensitivity of neutrinos interacting with the detector is almost the same as of the dark matter interacting with the detector. All right. But recently there were some excitements. Uh, Xenon Wanton reported that uh, there is some fluctuations at a very low energy, like order of a keV. And uh, uh, this was uh, an exciting news. People thought perhaps uh, this guy, this may be a dark matter event. But for WIMP-like candidates, this is not a very happy news because WIMP uh, usually has to have a masses of the order of uh, GEVs, right? And this was observed at a very, very low energy. You know, QCD axions was one of the postulates, or one of the things that people searched for, which can, uh, you know, uh, serve the credentials of a KV order or a MEV order dark matter. So, uh, but we we do not have a confirmative because the paper, if you look into, they say that uh, we cannot say that whether it's a concrete hint of finding a dark matter, but sufficiently, uh, uh, interestingly, there is a fluctuation, and this will be looked more closely to say whether this is really a dark matter event. So this is one interesting uh, point of it. Then let me come to another search aspect of the dark matter. So I say that, well, you can have a, your detector and the dark matter comes and heats it and gives you a nuclear recoil. That can be a signature. But you can also produce dark matter directly in the collision of the standard model particles. And that is what is called the collider search of dark matter. And uh, particularly because we have right now a particle collider which is running at CERN, Switzerland, which is a proton-proton collision machine. And you perhaps have heard the name of it. This is called Large Hadron Collider. It's a huge machine which discovered the Higgs boson in 2012. And so this is a picture of the tunnel. Uh, and, they, uh, and, 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 and we expect to find dark matter out of it. How do we expect to find the dark matter out of it? This is once again from the same cartoon that I had uh, given in the earlier slides through which the dark matter actually obtains the correct relic density, through which the dark matter can, ha can have an interaction and scattering with the standard model particles through direct search. Through the same interaction, you can say, well, now if I change the diagram, the arrow of it, and I can collide the two standard model particles, I can produce a pair of dark matter particles, right? So this is the same interaction through which we can produce dark matters in this proton-proton collision machine, which is at LHC. And it turns out that there are two major classes of the dark matter signal that you can see at LHC. The first of its kind there is that, that you do not produce the dark matter, but you produce a heavier particle within the dark sector. So if you have a richer dark sector, then you can produce a heavier particle, which eventually decays into dark matter associated with the leptons and jets and that is the first picture in this uh, uh, in this uh, uh, blue pick uh, thing and that is what gives you a multi lepton or multi jet signature and the second is exactly the cartoon that i have drawn at the bottom of the page and that is just produces a pair of dark matter but if it just produces a pair of dark matter it sees nothing because dark matter is electromagnetic charge neutral so this is going to escape a detector. So you have to radiate something out of the initial state uh, to see a signal. And that is what is attributed as mono signatures. I will elaborate uh, upon it uh, a little more in the next slide. Uh, 
So therefore, dark matter is extensively searched at the Large Hadron Collider. But once again, we ask this question, but, but dark matter do not have electromagnetic charges. So therefore, they cannot be identified in the detector the way that we could identify electrons, muons, tau's, or the jets, you know, quarks and gluons and so on, or the photons rather. So therefore, how do we see or how do we realize the presence of dark matter in a collider is an important question. But in order to answer that, let me first draw a few Feynman graphs, uh, which classifies as uh, mono X signals, which can be produced from uh, pro producing a dark matter. You know, you can radiate a photon from the initial state, then you can get a photon plus dark matter. You can radiate a jet from the initial state, then you get jet plus dark matter. You can radiate a W boson, in the from the initial state and you get a mono w plus uh, dark matter signal similarly you can get mono higgs and mono z and so on so this is a wide class of possibility where you actually see for or look for an x which constituted of uh, photon jet w z and h along with missing energy so, uh, so just one one query here about the jet is it something like a stream of particles or Yes, exactly. Jet is a, a jet is a, a jet. A, 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 you know what happens? That uh, it's a very interesting point in QCD that when you radiate a quark, because quark has colored uh, color charges and this they take part in strong interactions. And in nature, amazingly, the strong interaction is such a interaction that you do not see any uh, uh, colored object roaming freely in that nature. Like there is no free quark available in the market. So what this quarks does that once it gets apart, you know, you radiate a gluon here particularly, and those gluons, they also have the colors in them. So then those gluons actually emit some QQ bar pair, and all this eventually forms a bound state, which are called hadrons, you know, like mesons and baryons, and they form a structure, which we call jet. So this is all due to a radiation of a gluon from the initial state quark because it also has the QCD interaction. But eventually it forms a jet and that jet is actually registered in what is called the hadron calorimeter of the LHC and gives you a signature like, you know, you have observed a jet. And you can observe many jets, of course. This is just uh, talking about one possible jet which can come out, out of the initial state radiation. All right. So, um, so therefore, this is a class of signals for the dark matter at Large Hadron Collider that when you can see uh, a X plus missing energy, then uh, this X can be anything like a photon, J, W, Z, H, and so on and so forth. And once again, for the Richard dark sector, where you can produce the, uh, you know, a heavier particle in the dark sector, which eventually decays into the dark matter, but it eventually decays in the dark matter by radiating or decaying into some additional leptons and jets, okay? So therefore, the generic signature for those cases can be identified as N lepton plus N jets plus missing energy. So this missing energy term is something that that we have to understand. We can clearly see that when dark matter is produced at the collider, they cannot register themselves in the detector. So what you are going to see is an imbalance in the uh, momentum. Now let's consider a toy example and it will be very easy to understand what is the definition of missing energy and how you can realize in context of a collider. So suppose you have a reaction like A plus B going to C plus D plus E. Okay, so this A plus B is the collision of two initial state particles and you produce a C, suppose this is a jet and D plus E are the two dark matter particles that you have produced. Okay, so therefore you can define this missing transverse energy that is the correct definition of missing energy actually as you know the uh, sum of X component momenta of the two dark matter particles, right? Uh, X component, component momenta and Y component momenta. So you define the missing energy as PXD plus PXE whole square plus PYT plus PYE whole square, okay? And you take a square root. And so you can assume that this characterizes whatever momenta that you have missed in the detector, okay? So you can call it missing transverse momentum also, but it is traditionally being called missing energy. Now, then you will ask the question, but in the detector, I have no ways of seeing what is PXD, PXE, PYD, PYE, because I didn't see those tracks, right? Because those are dark matter, they have missed the detector. But there is one very interesting point that we can actually gauge what is PXD plus PXE from the momentum conservation relations itself. So suppose your LHC, the collision is occurring along the Z direction, right? So there is no initial momentum along the Y and 
uh, uh, x and y direction. So basically the momentum conservation will then tell you that Pxc plus Pxd plus Pxc will be equal to zero. And so therefore they, you can immediately see that Pxd plus Pxc is nothing but minus of Pxc. And similarly, Pyd plus Pye is nothing but minus Pyc. So therefore, this missing momentum associated to the dark matter can be easily attributed to Pxc whole square plus Pyc uh, whole square. That is the Pt of the visible object that you have produced in this condition. And that is precisely the reason that we have to radiate a particle in order to identify this missing energy in a collider context. And therefore, this gives you the uh, technical definition of what is called a missing energy. This is minus nothing but minus of pt visible and uh, visible momenta or visible transverse momenta you can easily chalk out from the square root of pxc whole square plus pyc whole square where c is the visible particle right so this this gives you a, uh, a this gives you a possibility of identifying a dark matter signal at lhc you say that i produce something if that is associated with sufficient amount of missing energy then can that can be a signature for my dark matter produced at this collider device. So let's now look into the collider data so far. And unfortunately, I'm not going to do, uh, do the details of it. I, I, I just want to show you that this is a missing energy distribution uh, of the events, uh, the missing energy, which I just defined right now. And this is uh, for two different events, like for from mono jet and mono V. Mono V means mono Z plus mono W, both taken together. And this plot actually shows you something very, very important. And it says that these are the data. These black dots that you see are basically the data that you have found from the experiment. Now, what you do that you can actually also look for similar kind of signals which are coming from the standard model events, like this uh, green uh, steps that you see. What was this green steps? Those are essentially Z. Z boson decaying to an invisible pair of neutrinos. So that can also mimic the signature of a monojet when you have a, a jet radiation from the initial state and you produce a, a pair of Z bosons which uh, invisibly decays to neutrinos completely. And it turns out that these backgrounds, the standard model background events, the fake events, which mimics the dark matter signal is so huge at the LHC that we have not being able to find out any signal yet in a collider context. And the data so far matches with the standard model background very well. All right, but this doesn't often, uh, of course, say that uh, we will not find the signal, find the signal in uh, near future, because I can tell you in the context of the discovery of Higgs boson, uh, the Higgs was discovered from a channel where Higgs decays to two photons. And once again, there are plenty of standard model processes which actually mimics this signature. And it was actually an effort of almost 50 years of looking for Higgs in different detectors, like starting from, uh, I mean, late era of LEP to Fermilab. And then at LHC, we were able to find the Higgs boson. And this involves a lot of efforts of reducing the background, uh, background events, which fakes your signal event. And the same is true for the dark matter signal. Having said that, so LHC is currently shut down and it is being upgraded uh, to run with a higher luminosity. Uh, uh, but uh, so we are all hopeful that with upgraded luminosity, uh, it will have more number of events. And so therefore the statistics will be more and uh, it will be perhaps possible for us to eliminate the standard model background and estimate or extract a possible dark matter signal out. And uh, however, before I go from this slide, I, I would also like to mention that apart from missing energy, there are also signatures like displaced vertex, long charge tracks, which are also associated to dark matters. But I will not talk about them. Those are details. Uh, uh, so I will move on. And uh, to end the hunt for the dark matter, I will talk about another possible search strategy for a dark matter. And that is basically saying that, in, you know, in the galactic, galactic core, in the dense region, uh, 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 you know, there are plenty of dark matters present uh, right now. And those can actually annihilate and produce a particle antiparticle pair. Now, this antiparticle is something very important for us because we know in the universe, although you know your Dirac equation has predicted that there should be equal amount of particle and antiparticle, it doesn't distinguish between the solution of a particle and antiparticle. But unfortunately, in nature, we only have particles that we see around, but there are no antiparticles. So there is a huge discrepancy which people are bothered, and that is another very important of area of research and which is sometimes connected to dark matter research as well. But 
the production of antiparticle if you see any excess of antiparticles present in this astrophysical evidences or this signature then you can say that because there are no uh, there are not many uh, ways of producing these antiparticles the, the, they must be coming from some dark matter annihilations like kai kai bar uh, so these are the dark matter pairs annihilating to a quark anti quark pair or a w plus and w minus pair and so on and so forth so there are different possible signals and this is also a very developed subject right now after the development of multi messenger astronomy so you look up in the sky once again with the ground based telescope belin bone detectors and space based experiments there are a lot of experiments which have been looking for this and there are some interesting results also which have been predicted for example the uh, uh, this ams02 they have actually uh, of, uh, they have predicted some excess in the positron fraction positron is an antiparticle of electron and that uh, that was also confirmed by farni i think and then there was this chinese experiment which started running very recently and uh, damp actually could report also an excess in electron positron spectra so these were all indicative of the presence of a dark matter and there were also events like uh, you know gamma ray uh, excess observed by fermi lat in some energy ranges but it turns out that it can all be taken very enthusiastically uh, enthusiastically and it is being studied under great details that what kind of signal this is uh, this is and they are trying to carefully subtract the background and uh, infer whether it is actually a dark matter signal it is indicative of so but it has not been confirmed so far but i think in the future with more and data and more statistics this will also be clear whether this is a dark matter indirect signature however there is one caveat here that i would also like to mention that there is a clash between this excess that you observe in the indirect search to match with the wink like model that we just cooked up that it is very difficult to produce so huge amount of antiparticle flux Uh, straight away after particularly uh, uh, addressing the relic density and direct search constraints that i just described so therefore there are lot of works that has to be done in this direction but uh, you know the whole world is uh, uh, doing it together and we are not far behind and i must talk about my collaborators and colleagues uh, at iit g uh, you see uh, all of them uh, debashish shayanda shobhan debu uh shomitroda paulos orunangshuda and all of, uh, all of them are, are actually after this dark matter hunt and they are looking into different aspects like collider and direct search prospects connecting dark matter to neutrino physics multipartite nature of dark matter connecting dark matter to the early universe cosmology like inflation some possibilities of modified gravity direct uh, uh, flavor physics connection or uh, dark matter in effective field theory so all this different prong approaches are being made uh, uh, all over the world and also at iit guwahati at this high energy theory group and uh, uh, i also must mention that uh, we are able to push our boundaries constantly because of the presence of a very smart intelligent enthusiastic and uh, uh, a group of research scholars that we currently have in our department and uh, i i'm really hopeful that uh, we will be able to uh, contribute uh, potentially to this ongoing research in the field of dark matters so this brings to the summary slides and uh, i do not have much to say here i will just say that uh, you know we have understood many of the things associated to dark matter particularly the classifications which can account for correct relic densities and so on and so forth which can explain all these observations like bullet cluster and etc but we still have actually a long way to go because we actually have not uh, yet confirmed a signal for dark matter in any of these experiments which i talked about like direct indirect and collider searches however i must also say that we uh, we we have pinned down a large uh, you know we have eradicated a large part of the cross section we have omitted a large classes of models we have said that uh, so therefore the search is getting uh, pinned down more and more with uh, with more experiments uh, or, and more data is being collected so the coming years are going to be challenging and it will perhaps decide the fate of this very elusive component of the universe and we at iitg uh, we hope that we will be able to contribute in some potential way so this will be my last uh, slide uh, where i would like to remind myself and you uh, a famous quote by arthur conan doyle who said that once you eliminate the impossible whatever remains no matter how improbable must be the truth and so the dark matter hunt is on 
And the question is, which dark horse wins the race? Thank you so much. Okay, so I will be up for some questions if you have. Yeah, so uh, Swayat, a very nice talk, okay? And uh, now the many of us also believe that why uh, it is so fascinating than uh, the, this ordinary matter. So you will have many, plenty of questions, I'm quite sure. Uh, one announcement I want to make that many people are listening on Facebook. So if they want to ask any question, they can basically write on the comment box and then it will be transferred to me by our technical staff, Basav. So with that, uh, uh, I can also see many questions on this chat box uh, in Google Meet. Uh, so uh, first I would open the floor for uh, audience uh, on Google Meet to ask the question. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. So I wanted to ask you, you in your presentation, you have showed us a power spectrum graph multiple moment in starting. Yes, exactly. This was this. <clears throat> I, I wanted to ask uh, how do we exactly, how do we exactly calculate this uh, dark matter density from these peaks in power spectrum? Can yeah, that's a very... Yeah, yeah, that is a very nice and uh, 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 tough question, actually. So see, I mean, I uh, this is all about this lambda CTM cosmological model that we actually have. So what I think what they do, that they this fit this model with some amount of lambda, which is accounted for dark energy, some amount of visible matter, and some amount of dark matter, okay, into uh, these uh, fluctuations. And then they try to parameterize it. It's just a way of parameterizing that uh, how much amount of dark energy, how much amount of dark matter, and how much amount of visible matter that can fit this anisotropy that you see in this power spectrum. So that is because it's a numerical technique and uh, it's a very sophisticated one. And this is a uh, specialized cosmological, uh, uh, you know, uh, phenomena. So I do not have more to say in that part. But it's a basically fitting of that lambda CDM model into the anisotropies uh, that you actually obtain. But uh, characteristically speaking, you can imagine that, uh, you know, you can think of sound wave moving in different mediums, like when it moves through, uh, uh, you know, air, when it moves through water, when it moves through some other medium, you, you know, the velocity changes. So, so the distribution may be, you know, accounting uh, to what kind of different uh, components of the universe is present. So that is something similar here. So this anisotropy, is basically uh, indicating what are the different constituents of the universe uh, that is present. And the rest uh, to fit this kind of spectrum is, uh, uh, I think, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a fitting of this lambda CDM model into the power spectrum that you observe. Yeah. And then there uh, you also have to do a very careful background subtraction and so on and so forth. So there are detailed methods uh, which I think I, I, I should not comment about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, any other question? <clears throat> so, uh, so I can read from the chat box. Uh, in the, so Saurabh Sarma, he is asking that how exactly we calculate dark matter density using sir, peaks from power spectrum. Sir, actually I did that. Mm. Uh, sorry? Sir, this was the same question I was asked. I asked oh, in chat oh, box. Oh, like, Oh, oh, okay. 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 Um, beneath, beneath, I have written a, one more question. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, you, you can spell it out. I can try to answer if I know. So the question was, see, in early universe, everything was all together, dark matter and the standard model particle. Then how now we see these halos and how did they form? They came into picture. Do we understand it? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, that's also a uh, uh, question which goes beyond my territory. Yeah, I mean, that's a, uh, a you know, I mean, the, how these halos have been formed uh, is is something which we do not understand. We understand the freeze out part of it, definitely, that it freezes out, but it is all involved. Uh, I think we, we do understand partly because uh, in this process of structure formation, 
you know uh, what you do that you calculate the potential well for these gravitating objects to fall into and fall uh, for, uh, you know fit into clusters so i think there is a way that you can uh, do this exercise and find out the dark matter distribution or the dark matter halo distribution uh, uh, hello uh, yes uh, yes uh, i am i am able to hear you yeah 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 so that is precisely my point so so uh, there is perhaps that is the way that uh, you can go about it to uh, compute uh, or predict uh, the halo distribution so uh, this was this uh, this was this uh, one small uh, uh, yeah this row r for example this is what is required to you know fit the relic density uh, uh, sorry the rot uh, rotation curve uh, constraint so uh, this can be perhaps done but most of these are done phenomenologically i mean just from the experimental yeah. observation you feed that uh, however there is a very nice and elaborate mechanism uh, to uh, explain the relic density of the dark matter which i explained like you have either this freeze out mechanism which uh, when the dark matter was in equilibrium and then that uh, freezes out to give you the correct relic abundance or in other hand you can also assume that the dark matter was not there but it is then uh, you know accumulates from the decay or annihilation of some other particles so these are two possibilities that i talked about there are more of course you can have a marriage mm -hmm. of both these two yeah thank you thank you that was all from my side yeah okay any other question so uh, suvadit can i read uh, two questions from uh, facebook uh, but i think kanhaiya was there to ask me some questions yeah yeah kanhaiya kanhaiya are you there perhaps he got bored yeah there. Uh, yeah but anyway okay so no, no, yeah, <laughs> so uh, there is one question from sinath uh, rathan kumar he asked this question are there any other rules than radius and mass of galaxies to predict the concept of dark matter uh no of course i mean see i mean as i briefly said that uh, uh, that uh, suppose for example this uh, gra uh, this uh, gravitational lensing they indicate the presence of dark matter there are also the structure formations which i just talked about briefly so this was just two examples which i quoted but there are many other 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 things that these dark matters do like you know i mean it turns out that if you only have visible matter uh, then it is difficult to gravitate them to form the structures but if you have dark matters they they can actually help sufficiently to form the structures that you see right now prevailing in the universe so the presence of dark matter is equally important and required from that aspect also so uh, you know there are other uh, aspects like this structure formation or gravitational lensing experiment so that also indicates the presence of dark matter so yeah that's what uh, so excepting for the rotational card about this evidences from the bullet cluster that i talked about then there are other evidences also and also of course we talked about the cosmological effect like this anisotropies in cmbr they indicate the presence of dark matter in the universe so that is another completely uncorrelated stuff that uh, we can think of okay uh, then other question from google meet chat box by uh, rishi rathore uh, is rishi here then he can ask question directly okay i can read it, i can read it out how did you how did you dark matter how did dark matter spread in end universe what collision explains it i uh, see that dark matter is basically collisionless objects uh, you know i mean i mean uh, so uh, basically it comes with the structure formation that how, how much dark matter will be where so this dark matter distribution will be related to that and that gives you a specific dark matter distribution with a, a, a you know more dark matter in the galactic core and it spread out and that is what is following this distribution which i just talked about uh, so so otherwise actually you can say that for example this evidences in bullet cluster basically tells you that this dark matters do not have too much of interactions in between so that basically Uh, uh what to say that basically restricts your dark matter dark matter interaction strength to something like 1 cm per square per gram and and that is an important constraint to abide by so in other way i will say that this uh, that that this is spread in the whole universe that is quite natural because it it is supposed to be collisionless and uh, uh, however this is still distributed because it has interactions with the visible sector so that's how there is a halo distribution okay. associated to then other question by abhishek taman he asked this question uh, does the dark matter percentage depend on the model we are working with 
Yeah, that's a very important question actually. So uh, it is indeed true. Suppose you change uh, completely your lambda CDM model to actually work with a modified gravity, <coughs> then you perhaps do not require a dark matter at all. But having said that, the modified gravity theory will not be able to describe any phenomena like that you observe in the bullet cluster. Like it will not give you a, 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 the gravitational lensing observations that you could do that there is a big amount of dark matter which has passed by when the two clusters collided and not interacting with each other. This cannot be described by modified gravity, but he is to precisely answer his question that this number density, this uh, dark matter density is subject to the model that you actually use. However, there is another uh, important thing that this lambda CDM model does. That is to actually uh, predict the accelerating universe, as I just said right now. That, that predicts the amount of acceleration that we can see right now in the universe. And, uh, you know, that is what constitutes the dark energy constituent of the dark, uh, uh, of the energy budget of the universe. So, so there are, uh, there are other, other areas which the standard cosmology has to address. So, therefore, that, that's why, uh, like, standard model in particle physics is a standard candle for us to use and then, you know, expand our theory beyond. Similarly, standard cosmology is a standard con uh, candle for, uh, for us also to use in the cosmological uh, description because that has been successful enough to predict many, 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 many things. So therefore, uh, 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 that's an important point to abide by. And with more and more data and more and more days coming, the precisions are uh, uh, getting uh, uh, enhanced enormously. So, yeah. So, uh, Subhadit, are you in the position to take more questions or should we close this session? I do not have a problem. I mean, I, I okay, have been shouting okay. anyway. Okay, okay. okay. So, so, so Chinmay Datta is asking this question. Does dark matter and dark energy have any correlation at all? No. It's a single line answer. Absolutely okay. no. Okay. So then other question by Ved Khase. He is asking if dark matter phases out, uh, that is their interaction reduces, will it in future suggest to interact at all? And we will never be able to detect it like the SM and DM separate together. Okay, so here I would like to clarify this point that see this interaction of the dark matter with the standard model was actually happening at a rate much uh, larger than the rate of expansion. And that's why you know that dark matter could keep up with the equilibrium at the early universe. But after the uh, universe exp uh, expands and cools down, this rate of interactions have already fall short of the expansion rate. So the dark matter has already freezes out and uh, have uh, created this dark halo which is prevailing in the universe. Okay? So therefore, the interaction of the dark matter with the visible sector therefore has to depend on the fact that you are moving within this uh, halo of the dark matter. So you will place your detector sensitive enough so that the dark matter can come and hit uh, the detector and scatters off to give you a nuclear recall signature. So although this is very difficult, but we have reached to a sensitivity of the order of 10 to the power minus 47 centimeters square almost. So it looks like that we can still pin it down because we have already discovered neutrinos beforehand. So uh, it doesn't look like uh, an impossible task, but of course, and task uh, with Okay. The, yeah. Okay, one general question is coming from Arup Jyoti Kakati. Uh, he is asking how the search for signal of dark matter and dark energy can influence the research on quantum information theory. I mean, how can we proceed the research on quantum information theory and need to know physics for the search of dark matter? So first uh, so of all, say. see, see. I mean, this question lies beyond the territory of me because yeah. first of all, I I must clarify that dark matter and dark energy has absolutely no correlation. Please bear it in mind. If there is any message that I convey from this talk, is firstly this that there is absolutely, absolutely no correlation between dark matter and dark energy. These are completely two different objects. We do not know what is the signal of dark energy, but we definitely know what can be the signals of dark matter, which has already been, you know, pinned down to a great extent. Now, uh, coming to your next point that uh, what is has to do with the quantum information technology, I don't think there is anything that it has to do with. You know, that that is my honest answer, I think. Okay. Uh, so another question from Nanu Alan Kachari. He is asking again general question. How can computer science help in the further study of dark matter? Any open source projects available? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, all this uh, structure formation and everything, 
these are big big computer simulation so uh, you know i mean when it comes to uh, cosmological side the computer science is very 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 important it plays a very important part so there are some of our colleagues who works in uh, this area uh, uh, but more towards theoretical side but uh, less on the simulation part but uh, uh, you know also in the in the simulation for these signals as i just mentioned i mean uh, just for this guy that uh, you know when you look for this dark matter signals in, at lhc say for example actually this goes much beyond than the computation of a cross section uh, that quantum field theory tells you because these integrations will become non ergodic integration because because if you have to segregate the standard model background from the signal then you have to integrate between some regions of the phase space okay and omitting most of the others so that that integral you cannot can never do analytically and for that computer simulation is the only way so this identifying signal suppose dark matter signal from the standard model background is once again a very important computer simulation task which particle physicists actually do some of the works also we take care of, uh, we do at iitg but you know it can be done in a more sophisticated way yeah so there are there are definitely uh, different sections where this can be done for example machine learning is now being used uh, in 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 doing the signal background se uh, segregation so where i think the inputs of the computer scientists will be very important okay one last question we are taking now on the from parthadas he is asking in the indirect search the dark yes. matter annihilate how it explains the stability uh that's a good question so it's a, it's basically uh, uh, you know it's a very local phenomena that you are actually pointing out and as i said that this kind of phenomena only occurs in the high dense region of galactic center so this is not prevailing in the all all way round in the universe so therefore this doesn't change your relic density uh, of the dark matter which we have already predicted but it's a local phenomena i mean at the highly dense regions yes. you can have this annihilation to produce yeah Okay, uh, so with this, once again, we thank uh, Subhadit for uh, such a nice and uh, fascinating talk on dark matter that uh, we always uh, thrilled about. And uh, I also thank all of you for very active participation. And hope I hope in the coming session you will participate in such an active way. And uh, so with that, I also would like to thank our technical team uh, headed by Basa Prokastia uh, for handling all the uh, technical part of the. session very nicely and uh, with that uh, uh, i uh, tell you goodbye and uh, see you next wednesday uh, no, next no, thursday basically no, basically no, next no, thursday no, no, no. Yeah. yeah next colloquium will be uh, delivered by professor sirupraj chaudhary uh, on the legacy of uh, professor asan bose so that is going to be very very interesting talk and uh, that we are keeping it on th thursday not on wednesday uh, thursday at 4 o'clock so we will intimate you in due time about the uh, details of the talk so okay. with that i uh, is it fine Yeah, yeah, this is fine. And, okay. Uh, I yeah. request all the participants, those who were here today, to attend that talk also because that will be of a very different flavor, but very informative. Uh, you being a very uh, nice speaker and uh, extremely knowledgeable person. And Shubhadeep, so thank you very much, and thanks to your home connection also. <laughs> okay. So, so with that, we formally uh, close the session. So, goodbye. Thank you. bye bye yeah. thank you for it okay bye